Hey everyone, before we get started with this episode, I just wanted to jump in really quick and let you know that we have a Q&A with the author of this month's book. Um, it will be edited in at the end of this episode, so make sure you stay tuned to the end of our discussion to hear our Q&A with Claire Lamon and the author. Coming to you from Strings and Things Studio in Ventura, California, I'm Katie. I'm Anne. And I'm Karen. And this is the Strings Unraveled Book Club. Woo! We are reading today um, Across the Formidable Sea by Claire Laminen. Well, we're not reading it today. Hopefully you've already read it. it. I was um, so excited. I really finished. I have plenty of time. Good. No, I finished mine. <laughs> I finished it Tuesday night, I think. So I, um, it was different because I had to read an actual physical book, which yeah, was nice. It was wonderful. It's a nice little change of pace. And, you know, so she self-published this book. Uh-huh. Every choice was right in what she did. Yeah. In the formatting. Because the texture of the cover yes. is lovely. Mm-hmm. The size of the book is perfect. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. the number of pages is great because that yep. cu- that's going to come from your formatting choices. The feel of the paper. Yeah, it's I a mean, good book. These, these might seem silly, but like those when you are have all to like spend time with yeah. a physical book, it is nice. <laughs> and I, uh, being a tactile person, which I think uh, you guys might be too. Yeah, mm-hmm. just every choice was perfect. So good uh, on you. Yeah, so Claire, the author, is my cousin, which is why I recommended this book. I have read it before. Um, I think she published it in 2017, so it's a couple years old. Um, and Karen had read it before, but Anne had not, so nope. we had a good excuse to... Uh, I knew I um, wanted to read it, so I was no no great need to like convince me this was okay. a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is um, about Laura Elliot Stratford, Um the year is 1920. It's been six years since Laura's beloved father passed away, since Laura's mother married a British earl and whisked Laura from her home in Virginia to the green expanses of Stratford. Lonely, rebellious, and bitterly resentful, Laura is especially vulnerable to the influence of two new people who enter her world. Graham, her stepfather's handsome new accountant, and Sarah, the youngest daughter of one of Birmingham's toughest families. Two sides of Laura are awakened, and they cannot peacefully coexist inside her. Laura is faced with the decision of choosing who she she will be, and neither choice is without consequence. Across the Formidable Sea follows one woman's search for home and happiness against the vibrant backdrop of 1920s England, a world whose priorities and values are shifting as quickly as Laura's are. No matter the time or place, we are the masters of our own fate, for better or for worse. So that's Mm -hmm. the blurb on the back of the book so my first question to you both is how did you like it i thought it was fantastic good i loved it so much when i read it into the first time that i put a good read i never do good reads recommendations oh, and like i did one like a review and uh-huh. i did one right away because i loved it and it's funny because i was kind of reviewing um recently the amazon reviews from throughout this time And it's just really fun to read so many great comments Mm -hmm. about the character development. They all love that the the main antagonist, Laura, has flaws. They're not trying to make her look perfect like a superhero. But you kind of love her and hate her at various times. Mm -hmm. And you don't really hate her. You're just kind of upset with her. (laughs) Well, I'm laughing because there's this moment um, where I'm like, this is such a low stakes thing. Like... um, intrigue that she's creating when she asked for this letter um and i and no no that was not low stakes no yeah no that wasn't it seemed (laughs) like it but it wasn't that becomes life or death like yeah literally i i really ended up loving that choice of actions Mm -hmm. because it ended up so unexpectedly yeah there's a whole murder in this book yeah I I must have forgotten that because when I read it, I was like, oh, my God, he's dead. (laughs) (laughs) But he deserved it. Oh, I guess there's two murders. the worst. Well, self-defense, manslaughter. There's a manslaughter and there's a heated, passionate murder. There's an attempted murder. Yeah. There's a lot going on. Yeah, it's very good. If you haven't read it, well, you shouldn't listen to this. Yeah, I mean, we we tell you this every time. There's so many twists and turns. (laughs) It's not a long book. You think you know what's going to happen? It's hard to put down. (laughs) Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. Yeah, it is hard for me to discipline myself into reading a physical book sometimes. That's why I I fall back on audiobooks because that's so much easier to slide into life. So I kept making these daily reading goals and like, 
easily surpassing them. Yeah, same. <laughs> I, I really had a hard time mm, putting it down. I had like a chunk of book left and I was like, oh, I got to get through this. Like yeah. I got to do it by, you know, what is today? Thursday. Yep. It was easy. Yep. Yeah. No problem at all. Yep. Like I kept counting down. I'm like, okay, and you have five more days on Saturday. And I'm like, and I finished it on Saturday night because yeah. it's, re- and that's when it's getting real good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a fun read. Um, so, so there aren't book club questions, questions specifically for this book. Um, but I have oh, our generic list we can um, go through. So, um, more book clubs should read this. Yeah, and exactly. Compose, um, yeah, so a smart person yeah. make a list of questions for this. Um, who was your favorite character? Um, ooh, I am gonna sneak one in. Mm-hmm. Surprising, it's gonna be Vera. Okay. She's not there very much. No. But she, like a lot of these characters, I wondered what they were doing off screen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what has Vera been through? What has she seen? You know, that she is the matriarch and kind of the queen of Birmingham. Yeah. And, um, and, and that she has these sons, Aaron and Jeremy, who are so capable in their own ways. Yeah. Um, and this lovely, like Sarah's a great character too. I, I love what I love Sarah, Sarah does for mm-hmm. Laura. Um. I think Laura is very dynamic because just as you said, like she's love hate. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. Like oh, this flippant girl. You know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes sense. And yet, like I, you know, I, I, I liked her. Um, so, but my favorite is Vera. I was, I want to know more about Vera. Mm-hmm. Okay. Can we just start making plot requests? Yeah. Claire, <laughs> if you're listening to this, if you write a sequel, we want more Vera. In Can it. you go back in time just a little ways? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And tell us a more prequel. about Vera. A yeah. Prequel. Ooh, yeah. See, why yeah. were you in my head? You stole my answer, <laughs> dang it. Because I just remember both times thinking, wow, the, you know, these guys seem tough. And then Vera, Vera, com- Vera, then Vera right? comes in the room. Yeah. I mean, yeah. she- I'm like, wow. And she's not, I, I get the sense in my head that she's not a big physical person no, but no, sarah so. it sounds like a, very, sarah sounds like a little like fairy I child wa- i wonder where aaron comes from because he's supposed to be so big <laughs> know, and, really. and jeremy is not a very big guy either like, i don't think he's supposed yeah. to be huge like his brother no. no no but wow the power that vera commands right. and the respect yeah what has gone through her life that you she is know. yeah yeah we need an origin story <laughs> origin story <laughs> future I was, future i was um pleasantly reminded how much i liked george her yeah. stepfather he yeah. seemed so nice to her and like he genuinely cared for her um and she did for him too you know they yeah they came i like to terms seeing with each other. that evolve because um like i love that, that part of sarah that like you you never stop mourning someone you love uh-huh. and especially a parent and um i could really you know identify with her on that but she she made room in her heart for George. Yeah, she she took him as he was. Yeah, it's it's easy to go down the like evil step parent route. Yeah, because that tends to be how I think it happens a lot of times in <laughs> yeah. real life too. Well, but I think I lo- that's what Laura wanted him to be too. Like yeah. like when we it would have been George, so much easier for her yeah. to want to leave if she hated but look, him. How many years did it take of her trying to provoke him and he did not give in to it? Well, no. it's it's like you knew she didn't want to like him the way that she antagonized him and the way she was describing him at first. Right. Like he's trying to get me by not reacting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Reverse psychology. <laughs> um, I remember when the book came out and I read it initially, my hope my like a lot of people in my family also read it. And I remembered as I was reading it, how funny it was that like the moms of the family, like my mom and my aunt. They were both like, I I understand why she chooses Jeremy, but like as a mom, like Graham's such a nice guy. <laughs> and I remembered that I'm like, oh, but poor Graham. But I I understand. But you know, I just remembered that dynamic that was like, oh, but 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 what well, about Graham? <laughs> Graham sounds like a dreamboat in his own right. Oh, a hundred percent. Like yes, yeah. <laughs> but Laura needed to choose her own path. Like yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. But yeah, Graham was not a bad catch for sure. Yeah, at the beginning when it's just Graham, you're like, this is so nice, it's so romantic, he's such a sweet guy, and then oh, Jeremy as soon comes as Jeremy in, and then you're like, that. oh, uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and then, you know, at the end when she's like, no, okay, I'm gonna marry Graham, and you're like, no, but what about yeah, Jeremy? No. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
the next question I have is what was your favorite part of the book? Favorite part of the book. Hmm. Well, I, I, I love how, she, how the book is sewn up. Like I like the climax. I love how all of that tension unties itself. I mean, not without consequences for right. people, but I, I like how Laura can, I like, I like how it ends. I like how Laura is, like yeah. takes control. She thinks she's powerless and she doesn't have place in this world that she's in. And she instead finds that those are the exact things that are going to take care of her and Jeremy and get them out of trouble. Yeah. You know, she goes in there and she blackmails the, the people <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it works. <laughs> I know that was so great. Yeah, there was so much that I didn't remember from the first time I read it. I was like, oh my goodness, look at that. Go, Laura. Yeah, that was fantastic. Yep. Um, I like the whole scene. Like, I, I imagine it like a movie, mm-hmm. like when they're going horseback riding with mm-hmm. her little brother and they're yeah. playing, and it was so cute. That is adorable. Yeah. I liked all the, like, the horse aspect of it because I'm I'm not a horse person. <laughs> I oh. like the idea of a horse. I don't want to ride one no. and I probably don't want to pet one cuz they're kind of scary, but like I like I like the idea of a horse. I yeah, I would like to, I like the idea of having horse mastery. Like the 12-year-old little girl in me that read oh, every yeah. horse novel ever published wants to be a horse person. But in reality, I feel very similar. They're kind of big and scary. And yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to be around them. Do you have a favorite part? I don't because I just love it. I do. I know it sounds lame to say that, but it's so well composed. The way you think what's going on and then something else pops up. My favorite part is just how well written it is. The fact that you lose yourself. Mm -hmm. I I easily lost myself. The rest of my family stopped existing. (laughs) All the things I needed to stop reading to go do were not important. (laughs) Well, I'm a bubble bath reader, so definitely got very pruny. Nice. I was glad that when I read it, hard I know... to do with a Kindle. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> kind of dangerous. Can't put it in a bag. Do that. Um, but then you can't really flip the page. No, I don't. Um, I tried. <laughs> I've, I've tried in this 2000 <laughs> when it was new. The first time I read this book, I was afraid I was blinded with the fact that Claire's, Claire's. my cousin and like my best friend. That oh. I was going to be like. Oh, but it's it's incredible, you know, because she did such a good job. But I was glad when I read it a second time. I mean, maybe it still is. I still think it's incredible, and I still think it's a good book. So, um, if you she's, have other opinions, she's don't not tell related me, to me, good. and I totally feel the same. Okay, <laughs> yeah, just stop. Yeah, <laughs> I will say, like, you appreciate I actually... the fine work of someone, and they just happen to be related to you. Yeah. Not a factor. I I started the, turning the first few pages with kind of a critical eye because. She's, you know, just a normal person yeah. that I've met. And I'm like, okay, well, she's just a normal person. Yeah. But nonetheless, she's a very talented author. <laughs> um. So the next question is, did you race to the end or was it more of a slow burn? Did you save it and read it real quick or did you space it out and enjoy it like over time or? I think for my reading habits, I read it pretty swiftly. Yeah. I it wasn't, I... I'm not a like sit down and read a whole book in a night anymore. I mean, as a anymore but if you could convert that into adult uh time to apply to reading it's like i sat down and read it in one sitting uh-huh. <laughs> it was a it was a quick read and and as i've said several times it was hard to put down i devoured it the first time but the second time i procrastinated a little bit and then i devoured it a second <laughs> time <laughs> yeah, it's always a, a juggle when it's when we do the book club because i want to finish it close to when we record so it's fresh but not short myself on time yeah so it's a balancing act so i think i waited until i had about two weeks to read this and that was perfect but i read it mostly in like a couple big chunks yeah but um yeah it was fun to read again um the next question is would you want to read another book by this author yes (laughs) yeah Um, we have tons of ideas yes oh yeah pump them out (laughs) so after i should have mentioned this at the top after we're done discussing this i'm going to edit in a little q a that we did with claire about the book and her process and all that good stuff so you will hear from the author specifically about some of these questions because we did ask her that's a real special privilege yeah that was great um if you could ask the author anything, what would it be? We already did that. Yeah, <laughs> we did, and you stay tuned to listen. Yeah. 
Um, it's harder to figure out questions when there's not some, and I thought about it. I'm like, oh, I could be the smart person that comes up with the poignant questions of the book, but I didn't. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have time to think about that. Yeah. Um, did this book remind you of any other books or have you read any other in this genre? Because historical, West fiction. historical fiction isn't really yeah, I a can't thing say. that I have read a lot of, but I do enjoy a romance novel and I enjoy a good romance. And there was, was something I was that I, while I was reading it that I was like, if you like this, you'll love this kind of feeling, but mm-hmm. now it has completely gone. Yeah. Obviously, if you want to go to Birmingham in this time of, and you want to watch a show, sign up for Peaky Blinders. Oh, yeah. Which I know the author mm-hmm. is a large fan of, so. Yeah. But it's it's different. Yeah. She definitely took a different tact on the similar time frame. She, the book ends with them going to New York to, like, start their new life. And I am excited to read about, if she decides to write a sequel, about that, like, what that leads to, mm-hmm. you know? Because there's so many possibilities of what could happen, you know? True. Um. I want them to have a falling out and not end up together uh, and be like estranged lovers who live in the same city. And Are they going to ever end up back with each other? Mm, I don't know. Oh. That's, I guess that's not up for us to decide. No. <laughs> I, I just thought, wouldn't that be interesting for it to not, not be this convenient love story, which I, Jeremy and Laura are too fiery of personalities. Yeah. For it to all just work out. The conflict in this book didn't come from the typical romance place, which is like a disagreement that brings them apart. And then they come back together at the end. You know, they're pretty, they're partners throughout the entire thing, pretty much. You know, the the conflict doesn't come from between the two of them because it's sort of like a, like a slow burn for them to end, to end up together and decide to be together. That, that happens basically at the end of the book. And you're like, well, when are we going to get there? But all the, uh, um, conflict comes from actual conflict. You know what I mean? Um, I, yeah, exterior. Not. I, I I like it when somebody like doesn't like each other though, because she's yeah. kind of like she's attracted to him, but just because you're attracted to someone doesn't mean you like them. That yeah, you kind of worry. You're like, but you don't hardly know each other. Yeah, <laughs> she doesn't trust his um, motivations. Like, yeah, understand where he's coming from or, um what he wants from her. So we can discuss some of the other characters in the novel. There's also um, Sybil. Sybil is a monster. Yeah. She is and the, uh, she's the, she, I mean, she's the, she's the accomplice to the murder of the poor girl. Is it Evelyn? That sounds right. The girl who, mm-hmm. who the Harvey, who is Sybil's beau, mm-hmm. murders a, um, would we call her a sex worker or just a good time girl who she, it's insinuated that yeah, she is a Yeah. I don't know what the term is at the time. Woozy? <laughs> Woozy? <laughs> uh, she was Oh, must... seamstress. That's what you put on your taxes. Oh, oh okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he's having an affair. I mean, they're not married, but he ha- he's having an affair with this um a lady of the night. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, and then he murders her. Yeah, he's so mad because Laura asked for a letter to entrap him and reveal his infidelity to Sybil, the monster. Mm-hmm. Sybil tortures and ostracizes Laura. Yeah, Laura doesn't have good intentions. No. But she, like, imagine trying to get back at your school but bully. You yeah. Know? And um, so she says, I have a letter for you. And she hides it in Harvey's pocket. And then Sybil's friends take the bait, drag her over to his his jacket, and find out that this girl has asked for a rendezvous with Harvey. And then she immediately breaks him off, breaks it off with him in a public place. And then he immediately goes over to Evelyn's and strangles her. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was imagining how you would feel as Laura in that situation, mm-hmm. you know, because that I mean it's not your fault because he's a terrible person. Yeah. You know, he worst. did it, Yeah, but it's like the catalyst that, or the straw that broke the camel's back mm-hmm. that sent him into a rage, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, I felt so bad for yeah. her because like you're saying, imagine that you are trying to get back at your school bully yeah. and then all of a sudden that ends up in somebody getting Never murdered. Never want to like, <laughs> that was certainly not her intention. No. You know? 
Um, that sort of ingrains her in with the crime family, mm-hmm. the Burns, you know. And we talked a little bit about Jeremy. There's also Sarah, his sister, who is very sweet and um, sort of adopts Sarah as a as a new friend. And um, that was nice because it didn't seem like Laura had any friends. Nope. Which was I didn't under I didn't quite un- I mean I guess I did understand why nobody liked her you know because but Sybil i guess if she comes the, from a different yeah. class and Sybil didn't like her she's yep. the the queen bee of the situation right yep. i'm trying to imagine if the if these characters were like in a um a heathers movie uh, <laughs> it was the heathers right? it was the heathers in a different time period yeah, yeah. in 1920s <laughs> england and there's no, nobody is psycho like a psychopath like gorgeous christian slater was yeah that is true <laughs> well maybe well harvey was yeah. he's, he's not delightful <laughs> no harvey, um, harvey is the worst yeah well he gets and he his... deserves what he gets yeah i still feel bad for i felt bad for laura at the beginning and then also when he gets what he gets and laura yeah. is right there to see what happens like well, she, oh, he's mm-hmm. strangling her yeah <laughs> he, he is a monster who almost took laura out of this world yeah and um I'm with Jeremy. What if it had been you? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, I also loved Aaron. The yeah, I don't know if he's the older. I don't. I guess uh, Jeremy's, Jeremy's the, the oldest. oldest. Yeah, uh, the bigger brother. Yes, he seemed like a <laughs> a sweet guy, a delightful goat. Even though not so much because you know what he's capable of. I yeah. guess. Yeah. I mean, he's like the hitman of the family. Well, it's um, I heard this about you know don't underestimate small dogs, and I started to kind of think of it about men is when oh. they're still. They're still dogs. Yeah. You know, so a small dog's still a dog. Yeah. And a man is still a man, even though he seems like lovable and sweet, you know? Yeah. But I, I, I was really right. thinking about short men, but, <laughs> but I, I find the ones, Aaron's not short. the ones like big dogs tend to be chill and they don't they're less likely to bite you than like little dogs. They're going to yip and be a little neurotic. It's like, and it's a Napoleon complex. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, there's the whole aspect of Laura's relationship with her parents, her mother and her stepfather. Um, we touched on George a little bit, but her mother... There, I mean, there's a whole reveal at the end that she's been lying to Laura her whole life about oh, how yeah. her father died. Yeah. Laura thinks that it was a... Um, a random... Yeah, robbery. a random act of violence. Instead, her grandparents are KKK members. And she, wow. Exactly. Yeah, that sort of... I forgot about that part of the movie. Or the movie, excuse me. The book, too. <laughs> but it run, It reads like a movie in your head. Yeah, because you can totally. imagine it. Yeah, that her, that her mother's parents were uh, members of a certain organization. It was like, oh, yeah. yeah, I forgot about that. That would make sense for this time period in the South. Because they, they're from Virginia. And be unforgivable. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can, I didn't want there to be, like, reconciliation between her and her mother at the yeah. end. Because it would have been so satisfying. I will say that is something I didn't like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no. I understand. But the uh, spiteful person in me is like, no, just leave. <laughs> Cut her off. Yeah. You don't need her. But it speaks to Laura's quality. Right. That she let her mother have that with her and, and that she felt complete. Mm-hmm. Um, and she had a hard time leaving because of her little brother too yeah. which was sweet um, that's the part of the book that I remember made me cry when I read it the first time um, because I have little boys in my life Aww. and it mm-hmm. I don't have a, a little brother but I have nephews who are you know of a similar age and I remember reading that thinking about how sad that would be but um, you can't blame her for wanting to get out and live her life and also um can't remember her brother's name uh jacob Jacob, yeah um i'm sure he'll miss her but he has an exciting life he gets to ride horses and he gets to be a little he's a little lord lord of the (laughs) manor right he's got a lot going on everyone dotes on him yeah he's got maids to chase around the house and tees and horses to ride and all that good stuff so i don't know how much he'll miss her i'm sure a lot but you know um who else vera we talked about a little Mm -hmm. bit the uh the mother of the crime lord family and then there's the italians the uh, the rival gang um what's the uh the sleazy guy's name that she oh. dances with um Ooh. i can't uh, remember his name i'll look it up because luciano is the like the head the head of the, of the yeah which i always like a good italian so i probably 
I'd probably be a, a tertiary character here. Just one of the chicks with the Italian mob. Yeah. <laughs> um, where is it? Hang on. Mm, doesn't matter. I can't think of his name. He's awful. Yeah. He was gross. Um, when Let's they call met- him Maurizio. What? Let's call him Maurizio. I, see, I want to know what it is. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter. But yeah, when they met the first time, and she's dancing with him at the bar, at yeah. the, the Red Lion, is that the name of the bar? No, they weren't at the Red Lion that night, because that's the night that um, Sarah takes her somewhere different. Oh, so uh-huh. So they didn't oh, expect yeah. to see Jeremy. Right. And Jeremy and Aaron show up. Yep. You're and, right. You're uh, right. You're right. Jeremy is immediately sober. Yeah, because she's dancing with the second this man the that Italian I can't, I can't remember. Um, and I kept saying, why do you care? Well, <laughs> because he cares. Because he's the yeah. uh, member of the rival uh, family, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, they did... It was interesting, the whole aspect of them being in with the law and buying yeah. off the, the police, you know, yeah. and... Um, Kind of like Peaky Blinders. <laughs> like I said, it might I mean, have been... Birmingham's, like, crime scene... Crime... Um, yeah, I don't... Crime scene's the wrong word, but, like, the... Uh, lay of the land. I mean, that's just gonna be how it is. It's mm-hmm. the structure of their... Of what's going on there. Um, yeah, because they plant the evidence of... Um, Harvey. M <laughs> in the... Uh, the, they say the Italian's backyard yeah, so that they can get blamed for it. Um, <laughs> it makes everybody happy, except the Italians. Except for the Italians, <laughs> who maybe might not think that that's so great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they escape off to New York for some other adventure in the future. So, yeah, um, yeah I definitely enjoyed reading it. I would recommend it to... It's, it's got a lot of... It's got different genres, so it can, mm-hmm. you know... Yeah, I'm a fan of a romance, romance, and if you're more of a fan of, like, a crime drama um, kind of thing, or... <laughs> You, know, you asked and... earlier if it reminded me of any mm-hmm. other any other book, and it, of course, I had it took a while to, for me to remember the title. I knew that, so. Uh, Larissa Brown is a knitwear designer, and she wrote a book and a sequel to it, which is sort of not. It's kind of a sequel and kind of not. You know, like those sequels that have they reference characters from the first book, but they're not really it's about the, the same, first book. Same universe. Yeah, uh-huh. it's called A Beautiful Wreck. Okay. Um, and it crosses genres and time periods because it's kind of a time traveling Viking romance. Ah, oh, that sounds, awesome. <laughs> that sounds exciting. <laughs> yeah, time traveling Vikings. How blonde and hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't read a lot from this time period, but it reminded me of when I watched Out in Abbey the first yeah. time. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. some aspects of it. Yeah, I can see that. You can see that influence. Hmm. Um, but that's one of the things I felt so refreshing about Down Abbey when it was new is like, wow, we never hear from this time period. Yeah, yeah, it was We hear fun. about before, we hear about after. <laughs> True. And I'm pretty sure this, uh, Claire's book is pre-Downton Abbey. Uh, Four years ago? that would be. No, Downton Oh, Abbey's no. No, that was around. a long time ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I would say Downton Abbey's ten years ago, probably. It's no. Very- Time doesn't go that oh, fast, does yeah, it? It does. No way. <laughs> 2010. Oh. <gasps> see? Yep. Wow. Dang. Katie wins. I'm so old. we can't say that uh, Downton Abbey was inspired by Across the Fermentable Sea, unfortunately. Whatever. We can say whatever we want. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. We might it be. our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we might be you stretching want, things. true sex? <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't that be awesome if that were true? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of times where we, there are rumors you wish were true because they'd be awesome. Yeah. Okay, so we are here with Claire, the author of our book for today. So thank Yay! you for joining us. Thank you for having me. We're very excited. Um, Claire is my cousin. We've known each other forever. So um, <laughs> I was excited when Anne and Karen both said, yeah, let's do her book. I had read it before. Karen had read it before and Anne had not, right? Not read it. Great. Aw. And I knew some of our customers had already read it or Waiting wanted four to. four years so. for a sequel. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so Maybe or no, baby. Should Keep waiting. Get, yeah, no, should we get the controversy out of the way already? Because I understand you get a lot of pressure for where is the sequel. Oh, yeah. But that's a, that's, that's a well-written book that people want to hear. <laughs> well, see, I can't wait it. to read your next book. 
Oh, thank you. Whenever but, it yes. is. Whenever I it is. I am happy for her story to stop where it is. Good. I'm, okay. Yeah. I like yeah. that yeah. take. Yeah. Okay. She can just go work and just go have her life. I feel like I, when I wrote it, I intentionally wanted it to be wrapped up it cleanly. So own. it could, yeah. So mm-hmm. it could stand on its own. I have definitely, so I have written the better part of a sequel, but I'm unhappy with it. <laughs> and so it's been something that I've been tinkering with for like the past, I guess it's been four years. I've been tinkering okay. with it and trying art, to make it happen. Art cannot be released until it is done. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Some... Change the names, make it a fresh story. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. And forget yeah, about the book one part. Yeah. <laughs> Some projects need to percolate longer, I think. Mm-hmm. And I think... Yeah especially um with writing that sometimes you have to mature along with your book and so sometimes it needs to sit until you're more mature and ready to write what you need to write if that makes if sense your characters are going to be more mature yeah, yeah that makes sense mm-hmm. yeah so it's something i'm sitting on I, you know i have it i have it all written i've got i think not like 90,000 words so a little oh, bit wow. longer than this one is uh-huh. um that are written, I just have not felt comfortable sharing it yet. So it's, I constantly go back and tinker with it. And then I think about it some longer. Someday I think it'll happen. So. Well, I'd be happy to read that. It has to age. Good. Yeah. But like wine and cheese. Yes. (laughs) Well, my first question for you, Claire, is what made you decide to publish this first book? Because knowing you, I have a feeling you've probably written more than you have published. That and is being true. Self-published, like what pushed you to like actually do it this time? So I have written other novels in the past, um, and I've finished other novels in the past. And this, to me, was the first book I felt like I wrote it, and I was proud of it, and it was readable. And it was an interesting kind of time in my life because I had a lot of other things going on, a lot of other projects I had work going on. And I had thought about trying to go the traditional publishing route and mm-hmm. sending out queries and, um, you know, finding an agent. And I think eventually that will still be in my future. But at the time, I was just so curious to know if other people thought what I had written was readable that mm-hmm. I decided to just put it out in the world and see what happened. And it was a really good experience. Um, I learned a lot from it at just how much work goes into the self-publishing process and, um, how much work it is to market yourself because yeah. <laughs> you know when you're traditionally yeah. published they do all that for you. Yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> so it's a lot of work um but it was such a it was a fun way to learn and it was a fun way to realize that hey I have this within me that I could write a book that yeah. other people mm-hmm. would enjoy reading. And so it was a test for me and so it's been um I think just a learning experience and eventually I think I will try and go the traditional publishing route with whatever I do next, uh, as long as if it's not the sequel to yeah. this. Um, so for my next book, I want to try and go the traditional publishing route because I learned a lot from this mm-hmm. and um, gained a lot of confidence, I think, that I didn't have before. So so how difficult was it to, like, press go? Like, when, it, when you decided you were going to do it, like, I feel like for me, I would get to that point and be like, okay, I'm going to publish and then be like, ooh, and I'm scared. But, like, if I <laughs> sent it to a publisher, that probably takes so much longer. Yeah. It's out of your hands. It probably doesn't feel as, like, here, here we go. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It was not as hard I, as you would think. Okay. But I think that's also my personality. I'm a little bit of an impulsive person, and I get impatient with things mm-hmm. quickly. And so, to me, it was like I worked and I worked and I formatted and I sent it to people and then I brought it back and formatted it again and sent it to more people to check it. And at the end I was like, if I have to look at this book for one more second, I'm going to scream. <laughs> and so <laughs> I had to, I had to edit and tweak until I got to that point. And then I was just so happy to be done with it that I couldn't that wait to fine. press the button. All right. And I still have moments of, I shouldn't have pressed the button. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go back and you think, Oh, there's still things I could have changed, yeah. which I think is natural, but, um, well, it's in your hands. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, yeah. You know, there's authors out there who take back their work and do that. Mm-hmm. But I'm totally That's the beauty of self publishing, too. Yeah. There's a lot of freedom there to, like, whenever I want it to be done, it can be done or I can, mm-hmm. I can change yeah. it. Or... I know for me, if I'm working on a big project, I get to the point where I'm like, done or almost done and I'm like I hate this Mm -hmm. and then I'm like I hate this stupid thing and then I finish (laughs) it and I'm like do all the work it's done and I'm like oh no I actually really like it you know my most favorite thing yeah 
Um, I'm always curious about like the editing process. Yeah. Like, how um, like how much transformation did you end up? Oh wow. Um, it went through. Gosh, I couldn't even count the number of drafts. Um, I mean, when I think so, I'm a millennial right i typed the whole thing out on a computer um so it you went through it with a quill. i did not write it with a quill <laughs> sadly i am not one of those people with my typewriter like hemingway like clacking away no i was on a computer in google docs for the most of this i think there's so much more freedom so right so it's hard to know like how many you know <clears throat> variations it went through in the early mm-hmm. stages but once i had reached a point where I realized it was a book. I did actually print it. Um, And I went through, I want to say, at least four iterations of being printed and penned. Mm -hmm. I would send it to my friend Joel Mm -hmm. Levin, who edited it for me. Um, And so I would hand him a binder full of my manuscript, (laughs) and he would send it back with his blue pen written all over it. And then I would read it, and I would fix it. And so it probably went through four printed iterations of edits and it's like it's a lot different than when I first wrote it or even when I look at my first outline that I wrote for it it's a completely different book like storylines were trashed you know yeah. um, characters were renamed all of those do things char- do you find that the characters kind of grow in that process they get more in the editing they bloom and develop into something different I think so absolutely yeah they you get to know them more the more time you spend with them <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> Did you get sick of spending time with any particular character? Which character were you tired of? I don't of? think so. No, I love them all. It's hard to say. None really? of them. Really? <laughs> Even Sybil? Even Sybil. I love her. <laughs> She's the worst, but I love her. One question of like, Sybil's horrible to Laura. Mm-hmm. But is Sybil horrible in the rest of her life? Like, yeah. Is she beloved by her family? You know, I'm you know, that's wondering that about her. A great question. I think she's pretty. I think she can be all around horrible. Yeah, but she's just, some people just suck. She's, she's pretty consistently. No, I think that she's. She's um, true to herself. She's true to herself. <laughs> she's someone's cup of tea, you know? Yeah. <laughs> My grandma used to say so there's a poncho for every panchita. And that is. <laughs> so someone out there is Sybil's poncho, you know? <laughs> Um, when did you first realize that you wanted to like be a writer? Like you were a kid or like when you sat down, you're like, I'm going to try and write a book today, you know, as a kid. Yeah. Yep. Um, I would say probably the first time it really germinated into an idea of a thing I could do would be around like fourth or fifth grade. Uh huh. Cause I've always been a reader. I have always loved to read. Um, and then there was a book. How old were you when you learned how to read? Three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a valid question. <laughs> Just a little kid. Aww, cute. So I've always loved to read. Um, and then I read a book by Andrew Clements. I don't remember if it's Clement or Clements, the guy who wrote Frindle. Um, so he wrote a book called The School Story, mm-hmm. and it's all about a little girl. A, I call her a little girl. She must have been. 10 or 11 in the story um so she wasn't little to me when i read the book yeah. <laughs> i was about yeah. the same age and she publishes a book that story is all oh, about wow. her publishing a book Aww. and it's really it's a fun little book and it talks all about the publishing industry but like at a level oh, that you so can cool. understand when you're like a middle grade reader so like from you know probably like 9 to 13 it was written for that age range and that book made me realize like i could write a book <laughs> like Aww. i could do that i could write a story you know yeah. i read a lot of stories so i could make that happen and i used to write little things here and there and Mm -hmm. I think my first quote-unquote novel that I wrote I think I was probably 14 probably like a freshman in high school I want to say some you know like do you still have it (laughs) how embarrassing would it be it it? would be so embarrassing (laughs) and I don't know if I still have it or not it may be somewhere in in some file yes in some computer somewhere that's so funny um, it would be terribly embarrassing. It was like, you know, one of those like classic, like self insert girl in a band books, yep. you know, that I fantasy. I can imagine and... you're 14 and I yeah. know exactly what it is. <laughs> it's exactly what it needed to be. That's so cute. Um, so, our, let's move back into like your, into this book that mm-hmm. we're talking about. So, 
number one, I asked you yesterday because I saw you. If you could cast the main characters as mm-hmm. like actors in a movie nowadays, like who would you pick to play these people? Because <sighs> I always love when a book gives you like a good description of a character, and you're like, oh, I could totally picture it. Like it helps me to know what does that person look like. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, I have like kind of a cop out answer because <laughs> I like have very specific visions for them in my head, mm-hmm. and it's hard to choose. Um. So, like, Laura and Jeremy, to me, are such people that I had a really hard time with this question Uh that it's, like, I can't (laughs) find the right person who matches them. Um, I have thought about, um, what is her name? Zoe Deutsch Uh as Laura. She's kind of got the look that I've thought of. Um, You know, she's youngish. She's about the right age. Um, Mm -hmm. I have a Pinterest board of like models and like face, they call, they call them face claims in right. like the world of writing or whatever. So I've got Pinterest boards, but they're mostly like, they're not actors, they're models or like people that Just I people. see on the internet. Yeah. And I'm like, that's what she looks that's like. Laura looks like. <laughs> yes. So I don't have for Laura and Jeremy, I don't have their, I don't have actors. Uh-huh. Um, George to me is uh, Ian Glenn, who's like from Game of Thrones. Okay. And he's also in Downton Abbey at one point. Um, Sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, I can see that. I like it. Yep. And uh, Laura's mom is Ashley Judd to me. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. I could see that. Mm-hmm. And so those two, I'm like, okay, yes, I have an actor mm-hmm. for you. I'm trying to remember if I have for anybody else. Graham. Oh, I was curious also about um Sarah. I don't have an actress for her. Huh. It's so hard. Yeah, I, can't, I bet. I can't commit. It's probably hard to ask, like, the author who, you know, <laughs> and thought of all of these people. You know, it's easier as a as a reader to be like, oh, I could picture someone. I always so. like to know what other people picture because that's totally, yeah. like, I, I'm not super attached to any one person for, you know, one right. actor or actress or... Sometimes when I'm reading, like, I can't get away from the idea of it being mm. a certain mm-hmm. actor, but I, I can feel that way with these characters, so you must have done a good job of communicating them as their own, <laughs> oh, as good. Their own people. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, were any of the characters inspired by any people you know in real life? Um, not particularly. Not, like, one-to-one, but, Not you know. one-to-one. Um... I did. I dedicated the book to my sister, and I think Laura has some parts of my sister in mm-hmm. her, um, because Sammy was like very. Uh, I got a lot of input from her in the beginnings of when I started writing the book, and so I think that Laura has some of her, some of her qualities, and I would kind of draw on that when I felt stuck. I could see that. Um. But other than that, definitely no one-to-ones and yeah. just, you know, kind of, you, you know, you pick things up from observing people, but n- nothing, nothing directly from my life. Okay. Um, did you always envision yourself writing in this genre? No. Okay. I used to want to write young adult fiction. Mm-hmm. I used to, um, I read when I was younger, I read a lot of Sarah Dessen. And I always kind of imagined myself writing more like young adult romance kind of things. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, this book just happened to me. This is the only book I can honestly say just happened to me. It was Uh like one day the idea came and it all came out and it was just there. It was like I had the plot. I had the characters. They all just came. And then I've kind of been stuck in historical fiction since. So it's interesting how it happened i didn't expect that to happen but but it just fit i'm not mad at it <laughs> do you think you'll stay in this time frame or do you um the, the book i've been working on most recently is um in the early 40s so i'm moving up a little bit um so I, i'm interested i think i will stay in the 20th century i'm not interested in much earlier than that mm-hmm. um but, and I eventually would like to write some contemporary too, but, um, I don't envision myself going much earlier than like 1900. Yeah. That makes sense. That's a lot of research. <laughs> yeah. I can, I imagine it's a lot of Googling of like, oh, gosh. what kind of car did they have All in this the year? time. <laughs> yeah. Um, what other authors have inspired you as far as like, I guess this kind of like genre, you read a lot of yes. this time frame. Um, 
I'm sorry, my brain is totally blanking right now. <laughs> okay. There's one particular author, and I'm like, I should know her name. Um, her name is Robson. Her last name is Robson. Hold on. She's Googling. Yes. Um, do, 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 do. Jennifer Robson is her name. <laughs> okay. She wrote a wonderful book called Somewhere in France, um, which I found very inspiring around the time that I wrote this. Um, and I think it was very well done. Um, I don't read as much historical fiction as I probably should as someone who's writing in that uh-huh. genre. But I also find that a lot of historical fiction is written either in a lot older um, time frames or World War Two. And yeah, mm-hmm. I, am... <laughs> I am always delighted by this, this period of time. Yeah. Just isn't that much. I enjoy this time period a lot too. And so it's um it's so refreshing. And it's... so like a lot happened. A lot happened, <laughs> yes. Um, the influence going forward. There's, yeah, it's such an interesting time period, and um, there's so many different like facets that you can focus on that I just find it so interesting. And so, um, finding other authors who have written in that time period. There's a great um, series by Libba Bray, who's one of my favorite authors. Um, wrote a book called The Diviners, which is more supernatural, but also is historical Mm. fiction. Mm -hmm. And all takes place in the 20s. That is fantastic. Mm. And I find her very inspiring. Um, The way that she she writes very fresh characters for historical periods. Um, So I would say Jennifer Robson, Libba Bray. Okay. um, I'm sure there's more. It's just one of those things. It's hard to... I didn't ask you these questions ahead of time, so you didn't have a chance to prepare. So that's fine. Um... Have you taken any, well, the places where the novel is set Mm. seem well flushed out. So I'm curious if you have taken any literary pilgrimages to these places or are they just inspired by research? I wish. Yeah. Just research in this book. I have not been to these places. I did a lot of research. I did a lot of looking at pictures and Google Maps and all of those things. (laughs) Um, mm -hmm. (laughs) Sometimes I'm like, like, I just went on a little trip. Yeah. Like yeah. Go walk the street and see what the neighborhood's like. Yes. Um, my next book that I'm I've been working on is um in a setting I'm much more familiar with and I'm really excited to uh, I feel like you might have told me what this is and if it's what I'm thinking of, I'm also very excited about yes. it. Yes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting to write something that I'm a lot more familiar with. Yes. It'll be it'll be interesting. Nice. Um what, okay, I have two hard questions for you. Okay. What's your most favorite book? Oh, oh you're, you're bringing the tough questions. I know. My most okay. My you can, most like, favorite add book. A asterisk if you have like of genres. Though. I'm sure that I do, but my go-to answer for this book for this question is, um, excuse me, "The Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood" by mm-hmm. Rebecca Wells. Mm-hmm. That has been. My favorite book since I was a teenager. I have read it probably more than any other book. Just gone back to it. It's like a comfort book. Mm -hmm. I think it's beautifully written. I love the characters. I love the setting. To me, it's like a perfect book. Nice. So I would say that. Okay. Recently. That was my other question. One of my other questions is what's your favorite thing you've read this year? Ooh, this year. Claire has read a lot of books. <laughs> this year, I challenged myself to read 52 books, oh, right. um, wow. which is, yeah, a book a week, yep. right? How yep. many weeks are in a year? 52. 52, <laughs> 52 right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I challenged myself to read a book a week because last year, I challenged myself to read, I think, 50 books and I did it and so I was like this year I could totally do 52 mm-hmm. um and somehow I've read 68 books already this year <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so I've been going crazy so I'm gonna look at my recently read list just to make sure okay. I'm not that forgetting not, anything because <laughs> yes because I have read a lot of things this year um I've been reading a lot of romance which is so fun and it goes quick and mm-hmm. so that's kind of helped me up my up my numbers this year <laughs> Um, but let's see. I know. I'm like, look, I read a book this month. I did about three a month. This is spoiler alert. I, I actually read a second book this month, what? but that's for later. I felt real like juice that I finished a physical book. Yeah, I know that is a big accomplishment. <laughs> and then I went back to audio. Oh, okay. I have a weird, <laughs> my favorite thing I've read this year. Okay. Um, I I'm, I'm double checking my list just to make sure I'm not forgetting something. But I think my favorite thing I've read this year was a book called 
My Best Friend's Exorcism (laughs) by Grady Hendrix, Uh who's a horror author. Oh, okay. Um, he wrote a book called um, Horror Store, which is like based on like IKEA. It's a crack up. Um, <laughs> he also wrote a book that I haven't read yet, but it's I think it, called yeah. like The Southern Girl's Guide to Slaying Vampires. It was really big last year. I haven't oh, read that one yet, but that um, is totally up my alley. Yeah, it's supposed to be good as well. But I read My Best Friend's Exorcism, um, which takes place in the eighties, mm-hmm. and it is like <laughs> Stranger Things meets The Exorcist Ooh. meets like oh gosh i don't valley even girl. know what meets valley oh, girl no. almost yes it's got like all of my favorite things it takes place in the south it's got wonderful female friendships uh-huh. and it just it really moved me it sounds strange but <laughs> that sounds nice it was it was really scary but also yeah. it was like it ended up being more about friendship and about girls like coming of age and, and slaying, being friends and, and slaying for bad things. Together. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> and I thought it was just so clever and like the setting was so interesting and the characters were so memorable and, you know, I don't want to spoil anything about it, but you know, the, <laughs> <laughs> the exorcist comes and you're expecting like the young priest and the old priest, yeah. like in the exorcist, but it's actually this like big beefy eighties, like fitness guy. And the whole <laughs> thing is just, I thought it was very clever. Apparently they're making a movie of it. I can't wait. Oh, that sounds fun. It was, I think my favorite thing I've read this year. Nice. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Highly recommend. Um, my other hard question is who's your favorite author? Ooh. Ooh. Great question. <laughs> Um, I love so many authors. I know um, you read, you tend to read a lot from the same author, I think. Like yeah. If they have, yeah. If I find them and I like them, um, who, who's my favorite author? I am a big fan of Rainbow Rowell. Mm-hmm. Um, Fangirl's one of my favorite books I've read of the past, I would I say, have, five years. I have years. read that one because you told me to, and it was very cute. Yeah, it's I love that book, and I love her and her style and just mm-hmm. the way that she looks at things and her turns of phrases, I think. Um, I already mentioned Libba Bray, but I think she's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Her um, Great and Terrible Beauty series is really good. She's got a great one um, that I can't remember the title of right now, but it's like a... I think it's called Beauty Queens, and it's like the female version of Lord of the Flies. It's a oh, bunch of girls oh. on their way to a beauty pageant, then their plane oh, crashes, and they all get stuck on an island I love together. Lord of the Flies. So oh, this is so beauty good. Queens tearing each other up. Just it's it's a delight. Um, Libba Bray's fantastic. Uh, I think she's wonderful. I already mentioned Sarah Dessen because she was like formative to me as a young reader. Mm-hmm. Um, she's also one of my favorite authors for that reason. I think. Um, who else? Have you read A Blade So Black? No. It's like a modern urban take on um, some, on Alice in Wonderland. Ooh. It's really, and there's a sequel to it. It's okay. It's really, really good. I'm going to add that to my list. All right. Um, Willa Cather, as far as ah. like classic authors, yeah, okay. is yeah. one of my favorites as well. Um, Song of the Lark is one of like my favorite books, which I think is the like um, epigraph in this book, in Across oh, the Formidable yeah, Sea. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes it is one of my favorites um and i also love um <sighs> goodness um heather cox and jessica morgan they wrote um a book called the royal we and its sequel is the air affair um but they also write one of my favorite blogs and so they're one of my favorite authors i think they're very witty and i enjoy them a lot nice so is that a- that's plenty that's <laughs> so many plenty. answers <laughs> it's um, so hard to choose no that's that's fine when you read 60 something books in a year i can understand <laughs> not even a year half a year um well do we have any other questions for claire before we send her on her way and say thank you okay. thank you thank you guys it was a delight. It yeah was a great book we i'm really it. glad you enjoyed it yeah, yeah. Good. all right i appreciate it Well, anybody have anything else to uh, anything else they want to talk about? Uh, any book recommendations? Um, I actually read another book this Ooh. month, which was surprising because I don't normally, but I did a lot of quilting, so I had to listen to something while I was doing it, um, and I was like caught up on podcasts. So I finally read a book that was in my list for a long time, which is Educated 
by Tara Westover. Oh, yeah. Was that good? Mm. It was incredible. Um, I highly recommend it. I think everybody in the world has almost read it, but if you haven't, you should read it. (laughs) It was great. Um, It's free on the Cloud Library app if you have the... Uh, a library card you can listen to it Mm -hmm. um it was great it's about the story of a girl who's raised in rural idaho um completely uneducated her father is um kind of a maniac uh like doomsday prepper paranoid also ultra religious in her uh abusive upbringing as a child and then leaving and becoming educated and like uh going to school for the first time and coming to terms with her um childhood and the way she grew up and stuff so and it's a memoir um, written by the author um it was very good and i saw that the author is or somebody mentioned to me the author is doing a um speaker talk at the civic arts plaza later this year mm. and i thought that would be great to go to but you have to subscribe to like the whole series and i'm not spending five hundred dollars on yeah. tickets for the civic <laughs> arts plaza no. otherwise i would very much have liked to go but if you have tickets to that series you should go listen to her because the book was really really great um I wasn't sure about the emotional journey that was going to take. It was hard to listen to at some points. It was good that I was, that I listened to it while I was doing something else. If Mm. I had to actually read the book, I think it would have been a lot harder um, because there were some aspects of her life that were difficult to listen to. So, but it it was very good. Um, It's one of those that I think is going to stick with me for a long time. I'm going to remember it for a long time. I remember my mom reading it years ago and telling me you should read this book and then I mentioned it to her she, and she, it brought her back too about how much she enjoyed it so highly recommend Very mm. good. anybody else Karen okay so the book I'm going to recommend is technically a cookbook but it is so <laughs> so much but book. it is so much more because uh, it's called Jubilee Recipes from Two Centuries of African American Cooking and I yes I have already started making the recipes But Tony Tipton Martin went and spent years just going through every bookstore, old bookstore, libraries for every kind of like old, old um, recipe book of various things that um, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, antebellum Uh and, and beyond. And, um, and up to modern times. And it, it kind of goes with the, um, and the other book I was reading about how African American farmers bring oh, yeah. are, are so important to our culture, but even their cooking is such a part of our culture and the stories behind some of the recipes and the and some of the traditions was just really, really insightful and beautiful and um good. and the food recipes are also very tasty. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I have not made the shrimp one on the cover yet, but it is but as a lover of all things shrimp and crustacean, it will be on my, on my, on my list. I have made the black eyed peas. Mm. Um, it's much better than like, I have memories of, ch- of my childhood in Texas and, and parts of St. Louis where with black eyed peas and I did not appreciate them then, mm-hmm. or maybe they just didn't cook them this way, <laughs> <laughs> Could be. but these were so delicious. It was a, it was kind of a black eyed pea and red rice. Mm. That recipe so it was delicious a new year's day recipe for uh, good luck mm-hmm. and there's stories about that, oh, that sounds <laughs> and great. um yeah so and their collard green recipe is pretty awesome i love good collard greens mm-hmm. she's got much. a couple different varieties of those recipes mm-hmm. but um i'm disappointed that the bugs have taken over the collard greens mm-hmm. and in my in my garden yeah all our leafy vegetables bolted while we were on our trip so, well, well I will say I was worried about that on, on my trip, but my eldest went out every morning and watered oh, and he he did he, this young man took care of the family. He he made food. He had food for people on other nights oh, so they didn't have to, to do. He, <laughs> yeah, he was like a natural nurturer. He was all, it was awesome. Uh, uh, and um okay, so I have this structure where the cucumbers are. And um, let's just say some of them could star in very racy <laughs> <laughs> videos. I just saw, I just and saw, they were taken down the structure. I saw a video Seriously. of this, like, dad. Jack of the killer cucumber. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, XXX. <laughs> I saw a video of this proud grandpa who was also growing cucumbers, and it was hanging from a structure. But he had built a little, like, platform for it that like came down and supported the weight of it because it was also threatening to fall off early he had a banana hammock for it 
I went to the men's section and I rigged this. <laughs> we'll say I juiced them this today this week oh. and they were so good. Um, but yeah, so nice. Jubilee by Tony Tipton Martin. I highly recommend. Um, it's like I said, it's a cookbook and a, and stories, which nice. are really awesome. That sounds fantastic. Um, I would like to recommend the almost legendary Morris Sisters. I just heard about this book just this week. It's um, by Julie Clam. And it's these women are like legends in her own family. Okay. And they're these sisters who never married. Or no, they had they one of them married for a little while. But basically, they were unmarried women in New York, made a grip of money in the stock market and all kinds of like gregorious stories of their lives. Uh-huh. And What's the title so, again? The Almost Legendary Morris Sisters. So she wanted to know the real stories of uh-huh. these women. And she spe- it's supposed to be like an untangling of what the true story is. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so the thing I read was like, Basically, you should just acknowledge that all of your family's stories are not true. (laughs) (laughs) Or highly exaggerated. Yeah, because they grow and change. Details change. You know, every time you access the memory, it changes. But this, it just sounded amazing. And it is from, like, this sort of time frame, I I would say. It's, like, their turn of the century. That um, sounds like women it's a novel yeah one of the morris sisters later became a successful wall street trader and advised franklin roosevelt the sisters lived together in new york study none of them married or had children and one even had an affair with jp morgan Ooh. it's a it's a memoir it's oh, not okay. a novel yeah that sounds fun um so i'm looking forward to, to Great. starting that and I guess it's my month to choose. And it's to pick our next book. So what are we reading? Um, I am going to throw us into, forgive the expletives, Uh-oh. listeners, Night Bitch. <laughs> it's not really a bad word because it is referring to a female dog. Okay. Um, by Rachel Yoder. Um, it was recommended in um, the Instagram feed of our favorite local bookstore, Timber. Mm. Um, the plot is... One day, the mother was a mother, but then one night, she was quite suddenly something else. An ambitious mother puts her art career on hold to stay at home with her newborn son, but the experience does not match her imagination. Two years later, she steps into the bathroom for a break from her toddler's demands, only to discover a dense patch of hair on the back of her neck. In the mirror, her canine suddenly looks sharper than she remembers. Her husband, who travels for work five days a week, calls casually dismisses her fears from faraway hotels as the mother's symptoms intensify and her temptation to give into her new dog impulses peak (laughs) she struggles to keep her alter canine identity secret seeking a cure at the library she (laughs) discovers the mysterious academic tome that which becomes her bible a field guide to magical women a mythical ethnography Okay. And meets a group of mommies involved in multi-level marketing schemes <laughs> who may also be more than what they seem. Oh my goodness. An outrageously original novel of ideas about art, power, and womanhood wrapped in a satirical fairy tale, Night Bitch will make you want to howl in laughter and recognition, and you should. You oh, should howl as much this. as you want. So, Night that Bitch by fun. Rachel Yoder. Awesome. That sounds fun. I'm excited about that. Uh, you can buy a copy at Timber Books or wherever your books are sold. Uh, and you can also listen to it on Audible. <laughs> nice. Well, that sounds fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, next month we will talk about that, I guess. So All right. if you um, have any questions for us or any um, book recommendations for future episodes, please tell us because we would like to um, read what you guys would like to hear us talk about. Um, and we will be back in a couple weeks for our normal, regularly scheduled podcast. So until then, um, we'll see you then. Bye. Bye.